Okay, very good morning. Thursday, 5th of March. Just going to have a talk through then some of the main reasons why Wall Street printed the Dow Jones. The stat I saw this morning was the sixth, second biggest rally in the Dow in history. Uh, and actually, the past seven sessions have seen the, the kind of wildest price swings that we've had in the last seven sessions since the inception of the S&P 500 in 1982. So a couple of stats for you. Uh, so, yeah, if you are new to markets, uh, quite an unprecedented time uh, to, have, to have been involved and, and certainly uh, a fantastic learning situation, perhaps a difficult one, though, to, uh, to expect upon yourself a real performance. And I think that's quite a key thing. I think anyone who has been trading over the last few weeks, um, you know, Obviously, the, the benefit of experience uh, is quite a telling thing. But if that's not the case for you, then you know don't be too hard on yourself. I mean, the type of volatility that we've seen, as I said, uh, has never been seen before in the entirety of the existence of the S and P 500. So, you know, if you're finding it quite tricky, it's unsurprising uh, if it's all kind of brand new and fresh to you. So, things will revert back to normality at some point, but. Uh, certainly the, the severity of yesterday's rally, I think, caught me certainly a little bit by surprise. I mean, we we're talking to a couple of the guys about this, this kind of range of consolidation the S&P was in. But then, as you probably saw, there was a big headline development overnight where basically the U.S. have come out and pledged three times more than what Trump was asking for in proposed sp spending for the economy in order to counteract specifically coronavirus. And that helping just fire things up in combination with uh, the kind of big switch we've seen in the Democratic nomination with Joe Biden now the firm favorite. The IMF have come out and they're pledging also um, monetary funds to those being hit by the virus. And this, of course, comes in the context of the Bank of Canada, the RBA, the Fed have all been cutting and markets now are 100 percent priced for a Bank of England rate cut or sorry, an ECB rate cut and also his price for a Bank of England rate cut. So, you know, this is the, uh, the kind of nature of what I guess markets were, were looking for from a more positive response was you know, the disappointment and the sell off from the Fed that we saw two days ago. You know, it's quite different now because now you're getting a real coordinated and larger fiscal response and other central banks are starting to follow suit now as what we've seen uh, from the RBA and the BOC and what markets are anticipating, as I said, for those other major Western central banks. So as things stand at the moment, though, um, I think probably yesterday might like what we've seen in other occasions. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, when the market does sell off a great deal, you know, the period thereafter, you see a little bit of a bounce of normal, just short term profit taking on those speculative shorts is kind of the opposite this time round. So these US index futures have just come off a little, albeit still higher than where we were this time yesterday. Uh, gold's pretty quiet. T notes are pretty quiet overall, but both are down. So it would be reflective of that general risk appetite from the Wall Street close. So gold's down about five bucks, T notes down about eight, but it's been pretty sideways price action in the overnight session. And the currency market the dollar's pretty flat. I mean, in terms of the euro dollar pair and cable, Sam obviously will, in a moment, we'll talk about that more technically. But yesterday, obviously, a, a good test and bounce off that quite key level down in the futures at around the 111 handle. Uh, that was being the previous high that we had right at the beginning of this month, and also the test that we saw at the beginning of the week. Uh, and a rejection of that failed to break, and it bounced back up quite meaningfully. Uh, and we're back to just test um, the yesterday evening or, uh, I guess, afternoon US price action low that we had. Um, cable, a little bit of outperformance, um, comes despite you know, still a lot of kind of negative press, I guess, you're getting at the moment uh, in respect to you know, the upcoming UK budget that's coming out. That's obviously got to be pivoted more now to counteracting the potential implications uh, that any type of uh, quarantine in areas of the UK to contain the virus outbreak if that does materialize the impact that might have on the economy uh, and, and so on so banks like Goldman Sachs for example are now expecting I, think I read a 50 basis point rate cut 
coming up in the next meeting, which is on the 26th of March. Uh, but irrespective of that, I guess a great deal of it is, is priced in to some respect at the moment. So um, a little bit of a break higher for the time being. And you can see there a relatively nice, nice footing that you've got technically, I'd say, for cable from some of the previous price action that we can see over the last kind of two weeks. You've got that low here, late Feb, retest again and again third time of asking really on a more a more firm test and we had a big sell off on the break of that and now that key level has now turned support you can see it it reacted to that level really nicely in the asia pacific level and it's used it as a bit of a springboard to move back higher again so perhaps then a, a strong level of of support for the time being but let's get into some of the headlines. I'll leave the charts more for Sam to, to have a look at. And this was that headline that really was the predominant factor that drove markets higher yesterday. Uh, and that was that the House of Representatives have approved an $8 billion spending package intended on combating uh, the coronavirus, including funds for protective equipment, testing, surveillance, and so on. Um, to put that into some context, obviously market moves against expectations. Last week, Trump was asking for basically one third of that amount, and he's got three times more. So great stuff for, for, for him in that respect, that all politicians are kind of gathering around with a coordinated effort to counteract what is, I'm still anticipating, a multi-thousand type level of cases in America over the coming week or so. Uh, and, and I think that's you know, this is why I think Trump has done a pretty good job. Remember, he held that press conference about a week ago when there wasn't really much in the way of cases at all. And you might have thought, well, is he going to spook people? But I think by just putting this coronavirus seed in people's head early and allowing then him to come out, get this job done on Capitol Hill for the spending programs, you know, as long as you can control the human, both for markets and consumer, their psyche, then you can counteract then this whole big sell-off and fear trade that we had last week. And you know, this is what Trump is good at, uh, I think, in, in this respect. So is it enough? And you know, do we continue to recover? I don't know. Yesterday was such a, a big move, uh, just like we had last week, you know, down days. You know, one thing that's very common in markets, markets generally move much more violently going down than they do going up. So after a thousand plus point second biggest rally ever in the Dow, I wouldn't be, my, my statistics would show that you're probably not going to get uh, another sizable day like that again. Uh, but plan, plan for, for, for the different scenarios, as we normally say. Um, so here, Democrats also counted $500 million in Medicare funds. So the actual total amount uh, that they've passed in Washington is $8.3 billion. Uh, the other thing, of course, of which was getting attention was the in the briefing this time yesterday was Joe Biden uh, obviously taking a real significant boost uh, not only did he perform uh, particularly well but Michael Bloomberg pulling out of the race has now thrown his support against Biden it's kind of the the stop Bernie Sanders job by, by the more centre uh, Democrats uh, the prospect of a Biden Trump showdown I mean, if you actually think about those two candidates, it's the elimination of Sanders, which is very important. Um, a Biden-Trump showdown, whoever wins, even though we're still firmly on the side that, that Trump will become the victor in the end, uh, is a clear positive for markets uh, and probably a small plus for the economy as well. If you think about Biden in himself, uh, has proposed tax rises, but they are relatively modest. Uh, he's got a light touch on regulation probably a softer line on tariffs on the global protectionist front that Trump's been doing and also he's probably going to have to go slightly left in order to capture some of that vote uh, as well to appease as he then fends off uh, any attempt from Sanders going forward in the next couple of weeks so all in all you know whoever wins it's kind of a net positive in a sense and I guess that explains as well partial of why we we, we rallied yesterday and then the other thing that's probably gone a little bit unnoticed was the IMF. Uh, the IMF have actually unveiled a $50 billion package of emergency financing, specifically for countries stricken by coronavirus. Uh, so, so again, it's just another fiscal. And this is what's so key to support markets when they were in freefall like last week. You cannot, you cannot expect just the Fed to prop up the entire global market. That's unrealistic and hence the reason why it sold off on that day of the emergency cut 
but now we're starting to see more evidence come through of real commitment to counteract it and hence the reason why we had uh, a day like yesterday. Um, as I said, the ECB, um, Bloomberg running the headlines talking about some of, I guess, yesterday's price movement, snapping a bit of a four-day winning streak. Uh, but markets now very much priced for the ECB to deliver on the fact that they're going to cut the deposit rate further once again. And here with the crib sheet, I did actually tweet this last night. It's probably quite a useful way of just um, consolidating quite a lot of information into a nice, easy, digestible graphic. And it's looking at the major central banks. So the key things are when are the dates. So you can see still quite a lot to come for March. Um, you've got the ECB on the 12th. You've got the Bank of England on the 26th. You've got the PBOC in China on the 20th. The SMB in Switzerland on the 19th, as well as Norway and so on. So still quite a lot to come. Um, as far as the ECB are concerned, this is from ING, uh, the Dutch bank. They're saying the ECB opted against a coordinated move with the Fed suggesting policymakers will wait and see until next week's meeting and then try to steer markets with words rather than action. However, don't rule out some measures if conditions deteriorate. Now, that's what ING is saying. So ING going for a little bit more of a neutral wait and see approach to just see how these numbers develop. And that was the kind of common thinking which caught a little bit of people by surprise when the Fed took such preemptive action, uh, just given how low the numbers are in actuality in the US at the moment. Uh, but markets are very much priced on the side of, of easing. Um, in terms of the Bank of England, uh, what ING are saying, and they're meeting towards the end of the month, arguably less sensitive to market moves from the Fed and has signalled it will take a little more time to judge the impact. But ultimately, uh, ING anticipating a 25 basis point rate cut, coupled perhaps with some credit easing, is likely at the March meeting, possibly before, which is quite quite interesting a statement to make as well but I'll leave you with that graphic it's on my my Twitter handle here if you want to have a look you can do in more detail um, with the Fed obviously there is still a Fed meeting happening this month um, and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out that's not for another uh, just under two weeks on the 18th and this is looking at market implied probability in the short end so at the moment markets are priced 73.5 percent that the fed are going to cut another 25 and there's a 26 and a half percent that they're going to cut another 50. so so markets are still definitely expecting uh, much more to come but you know definitely on that last if they went 50 again they repeat what they did earlier this week i mean that pretty much exhausts then that avenue of interest rates going forward so they'd be banking on the fact that that's enough and that over the coming weeks, you get the peak and then decline of the virus and subsequent impact. And that they, by doing now, gets ahead to promote then the real interest rate lowering effect into the economy, which is kind of a laggard effect. I guess the problem is, is that what if the virus picks up more aggressively than what we've seen, like in Italy, for example, uh, that could be a real problem then for the Fed given the, the limited ammunition they've got on the interest rate side. The final thing uh, I wanted to mention was this. We've got the OPEC meeting in Vienna. So um, yesterday, basically Saudi and Russia, the two main people to monitor as we go through today and tomorrow in this meeting, they are far apart according to reports on Bloomberg. This was at the kind of prelude to today's meeting, the OPEC plus it's called the JMMC, the Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee. This typically is more of a, a meeting just to see if they're adhering to their, their compliance of their quotas. So the biggest point here is that there still seems to be a big disagreement. And without Russia being on board, and Russia being obviously the second largest oil producing country in the world behind the United States, of which is a country, the US, which is producing oil at the moment, at record high levels, really putting the pressure on people like Saudi, obviously, who are really under uh, pressure to diversify their economy. So these sub-50 oil prices are hurting them at the moment. Uh, talk of the town is that basically Saudis want a reduction as big as 1.5 million, uh, whereas Russia basically don't want to cut at all. So, you know, this is what we're looking out for at the moment. And, and I do think, actually, this could be quite a meaningful moment then uh, for crude oil because I think the risk 
The risk for me is to the downside, uh, and that is they don't get a deal done and Russia doesn't agree. And therefore, I think oil is quite susceptible to some downside price action. If that happens, then I don't think it's unrealistic to see oil come back through, um, well, definitely this near-term area or a zone of support. And a breakthrough down there opens up the prospects of 45 again. Uh, and you've seen how oil tends to move in these types of situations. I wouldn't discount either by the end of the week. You might get down to these levels at 43.34. Um, you saw, you know, not that Fly B is a big issue for the global economy, but Fly B, one of the biggest national carriers in the airline space in the UK, has basically gone into administration last night. Uh, and that's a, that, that's a sign of the times, really. And that's why you, you heard yesterday's briefing, Goldman Sachs looking on the demand side for you know, big implications that this virus is going to have on tourism and relatable industries in that sense. And fuel consumption is a big component of oil demand. And, you know, if, if Russia don't agree to act, and the problem you've had is now that numbers like one and a half million have been thrown out there on the table, traders are hungry for a deep cuts. And not delivering a deep cut is going to be negative for price. And so that's why I think on the balance, there's risks to uh, potentially a deep move on the downside uh, of a multi-dollar nature. Um, if they were to deliver a cut of 1.5 million, um, that obviously would be bullish. And if there's some upside levels here to monitor, but I would say the likelihood of a deep cut like that, I think is minimal. The consensus on Wall Street is from economists that the cut, if they do one, would be around 750. But this is the problem when these oil ministers start opening their mouths, essentially, is that now markets, I think, would be disappointed with a 750 cut. Now you've mentioned 1.5. That's bad tactical management, in my opinion, from the Saudis, if you were to apply a central banking kind of forward guidance communicate uh, strategy. And so, yeah, keep an eye on oil is all I'm saying. Um, one thing to, to be aware of, OPEC has taken unprecedented steps this specific meeting of blocking journalists from entering its headquarters and also have scrapped a final press conference. For those of you who've never seen it before, it's an absolute media scrum at the OPEC event. Why? Because these oil ministers love saying stuff. Uh, and, and basically what that means then is that this is the oil chart I was looking at here and these, these deeper moves to keep an eye on at 45 and below. Uh, but what it means then, if journalists are not present, perhaps the ability to see leaks and rumors is diminished somewhat, but I would probably still remain pretty alert and vigilant for comments because usually uh, it's unlikely you need to wait till Friday afternoon's press conference for definitive confirmation of what's going to happen. Uh, so, so keep an eye out for from ensuing volatility to come over the next 48 hours. All right, quick look at the calendar and then we'll wrap things up with Sam. Uh, what have we got for this morning? Well, from a data point of view, Nothing, really. Um, you've got a couple of UK numbers, but quite frankly, they're not really market moving. And so we'll move to the US afternoon where things will start to heat up a little bit. Weekly jobless claims, factory orders in the US. Jobless claims not interested in uh, and don't anticipate that to move markets. Factory orders, normally I would be, but you know, like we've seen yesterday, I think a little bit of context perhaps uh, is quite key. Um, one thing that probably was another supportive factor for yesterday's aggra aggressive rally outside of this spending package to counter the virus, the IMF pledge, the Biden bump, is you had that ISM non-manufacturing, which was pretty spectacular yesterday in the US as well. Um, so factory orders, let's see. Um, it is a January reading, so it's quite backward looking, and obviously the markets are quite forward focused at the moment. So. Uh, I don't think it's going to be too meaningful uh, with that being said. Um, speakers, though, there's quite a few to, to monitor. Uh, I guess the key ones will be Bank of England's chief economist, Haldane. You know, what is the current insight of the Bank of England? He's talking off topic, um, so I wouldn't be expecting too much. But just given the context, probably worth monitoring if you're looking at the pound, just in case. Uh, the chief Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier, speaks in the first round of EU trade talks at 3 p.m. I would definitely not be expecting movement out of the pound on that. What are you going to expect from Michel Barnier today? 
is he's going to say this and then the UK are going to respond and say that and exactly where we are at the moment. There's going to be absolutely zero movement from their origination of their um, statement of their red lines at this point. It's way too early in the negotiating round. First round talks, nothing happens. That's just usual practice. So, yeah, maybe interesting to hear He'll talk about you know what Europe want and how far apart they are and to put the pressure back on Britain and that doesn't really uh, that's not really meaningful in respect to anything out of the blue so I wouldn't be expecting too much from that. Bank of England outgoing Governor Mark Carney speaks later on this, this afternoon. Then you've got Bank of Canada's Governor Polos and then Kaplan later for any fixed income traders. You do have quite a lot of Spanish French supply coming to market as well um, throughout the morning. All right, going to leave it at that. Let's hear what Sam's got to say. And I will see you later on. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Ant. I've just, uh, just seen a tweet. China's uh, CSI 300 index is at, uh, closing at its levels not seen in two years, uh, up at the highest, which is incredible um the dow jones yesterday <laughs> what a day i mean the range in this thing is is insane um god knows what's what's gonna happen in the in the coming in the coming days it's it's a, a really uh you know a, i think mark your levels up identify where you could see a reaction and have the patience to then when we get there just to have a little wait and see i was you know with the the guys and the other office we were talking about the, the bank of canada decision we we're sort of saying if they do 50 you know stocks could get a little bit of a bounce a little bit i mean they continue to push on and on and on uh, i guess the the you know if you're if you are bearish you know the fact that we didn't get above yesterday's high and had a little rejection could be you know in a way uh, a bit of a, a small win just to buy it uh, the big push. I think we're, we're actually coming to levels now which are quite interesting in, in US equities. You can see here, if I just mark up 30, 74 and uh, well, probably 30, 74 and a quarter, that and the pivot, uh, you can see we had a bit of resistance initially in early trade there yesterday before breaking through, coming back to test it around six. So you'd expect uh, some sort of reaction here. So, you know, these lines in the sand, if you like, these are you know, points where, you know, I'd just be looking for some sort of reaction before uh, they're making a decision on these markets because we've you know the range from uh, Tuesday afternoon to Tuesday evening low and then Mon um, then Wednesday's <laughs> early Asian session trade low to the higher just incredible uh, good v-shaped recovery which of course has been in, in topic this year but yeah keep an eye on that pivot I think that's a, a pretty key level uh, obviously if that is to break through then you know these moves can can gather pace relatively quickly it would be also keeping an eye on what the DAX is doing just to see if we can get a you know follow through from European trade and it's a similar kind of level here in the DAX you can see we had some nice price action initially around three o'clock around 4.30 just hitting uh, this resistance point we then broke through came back to test it and we're just on there now with the pivot uh, so if I'm looking for an opportunity in US equities at any point today, potentially to continue lower, these levels would have to go uh, for you know there to be that continuation. Uh, just bring over the Dow and, and just say that this level here is just a bit above its pivot. So just be you know aware of that uh, those highs that we initially had yesterday before that that push through. But yeah, strong moves in uh, in US equities here. You've got that again failed test of what would have been Tuesday's high. So uh, your, your V-shaped recovery is there, but we're just coming down to a bit of support now and, and down on the futures anyway, down 285, which two months ago would have been a big move. Now it's uh, nothing incredible. Uh, moving on to oil, obviously you know, now could start to see things pick up a bit. We're just actually pushing and drifting lower down to under 47. Uh, there's going to be a bit of support around here. So it's... Uh, Worth just keeping an eye on around the S1. You've got the lows from yesterday just a bit above there as well. And and what has been quite a good guide for for stocks in recent times is what oil has done. Um, I know it's you know got their, their their absolutely still will be days where they do their own thing. But to keep an eye here, if oil does continue to push lower, and I'd must stress there's a fair bit of support around this S1, then that might also help 
uh, the, the case for stocks to go lower. Uh, but having a look here at oil S1, this bit of a trend line that we're coming into play on a couple of smaller term levels in and around that pivot. We were in a bit of a range before that uh, level broke through. Uh, and then, of course, R1 looks like a, a pretty key point where you can see the, the sellers really did defend that area uh, around $48. Uh, I was still waiting yesterday patiently uh, for 49 if it was to come to then make a decision about you know do I see this market pushing higher and for me until it does uh, I think it's going to be relatively contained uh, but yeah keep an eye on that trend line uh, and that S1 Let's have a quick look over at gold which did as I'm saying just drop lower uh, in early trade we have just rebounded a touch relatively small range to begin that day uh, again it's mark up your, your key points of interest where uh, you could expect to see a reaction and, and these would be those points. I know, yes, fine little trend line breaks could happen from, from then uh, until, from now until uh, we get down to these points, of course, but really just looking at the lows that we had from yesterday, quite good support around there, almost a double bottom, okay, so 1633.8, I'm interested if it comes to make some sort of decision below there. You know, the S1, you know, if that was the break, that could be the target, for example. 1645 and a half, good, strong resistance, really, from 3 o'clock to, you know, after 6 p.m. And then above there, we just couldn't quite confirm a break at all from 1648 up towards uh, 1650. So, very important resistance zone. And gold is just doing uh, a bit of a range at the moment. You can see not much really happened yesterday for, for gold. It was supported at the top at the bottom and, and resisted at the top quite nicely so keep a, a key eye on those range levels which have, have dictated play so far moving over to a couple of the currencies uh, euro uh, not many people can quite understand why we were so high it's just now the opportunity to get short if you want to be late to the party with a bit more confirmation uh, a break of yesterday's lows you know there's no harm in, in sort of waiting for, for that to really go for there to be a continuation to the downside, you can see strong support yesterday, also Tuesday, and was resistance on Monday. You've got the S1 there as well. So if that is to, to go, fantastic. Uh, or if you're already in this trade, I think you've, you've got quite a nice ceiling yeah, here where at 111.50, along with the pivot, the higher the day, the higher of yesterday afternoon, which is also the morning support from uh, yesterday as well, is, is a good enough uh, area where as long as we stay below there, you'd be happy to be short. Of course, if you're intraday trading this, targeting down towards, uh, I would say, 111.17 uh, and then the lows down at 111.05, that would be how I'd be looking at that. Above the pivot, I think we can start to you know, push towards these key levels here, 111.74, and I'll just keep an eye on, on what was the high that we had on the second, so what would that be, Monday? Yeah, Monday, uh, and also yesterday's high around that R1. So like gold is doing now relatively relatively speaking pretty range bound up at these tops i know these moves are obviously a lot bigger than what has previously happened for euro but those would be the key levels that i'll be focusing on down at yesterday's lows 111.05 uh, and then 11150 in between there you might have a bit of support literally where we're trading now as we found some uh, buyers late last night uh, but at the moment those would be the key areas having a look over at the pound Oh, is this another one where you shoulda, coulda, woulda got in? That low we talked about on Monday, which was the, the high of the 11th of October. Since then, it's, it's up uh, nearly 200 pips, which is a, a great move, really extending through here. And I know you know, a couple of people I've seen on Twitter are, are liking the look now of, of a few pound longs against other, other pairs. And you can see here just extending through early trade. Resistance, however, coming up, so do be patient. Don't go chasing. Uh, this market just yet you can see there's quite a lot of lows in the mix here and then highs once we have broken through so all around 129.10 at r1 just be a bit patient you know perhaps waiting for either price to break through before getting in or a little pullback down to 129 key level as well if you are medium term or even intraday long and you book profit you've got uh, a bit of a floor here at 128.50 strong area of resistance we break through get a clean break and you know that's going to be you're happy to stay long as as, as long as uh, price remains above that but yeah the pound strong uh, today across the board uh, yen you can just see here just fighting back a bit so just keep an eye for dax which is trying to now if you see my middle left chart 
uh, just trying to break through that pivot. If that was to continue, you're going to get probably the yen just having another go at trying to break through its high uh, and T notes as well, which is just you know not doing too much in the morning. And, you know, always a bit risky trading it in early trade, but you can see here a bit of a range that we're in. If stocks were to continue lower, obviously that getting a break of that and, and similar for the, the bund above its pivot, you can see is a bit of a area of resistance and we're in therefore a bit of a range from those lows from yesterday as well. But early trade at the moment, uh, you know, not to, to say we're going to have a day like we had yesterday in terms of you know the point moves in the Dow Jones and NASDAQ and S&P, but uh, I'd be surprised if we continue to smash higher in a similar fashion. So a little pullback in European trade wouldn't uh, be the most unusual thing. Any questions as usual, guys, please uh, do let uh, us know. We'll be obviously throwing the, throughout the chat uh, throughout the day. So, yeah, I hope you all have a, a good one. And, uh, you know, markets are interesting at the moment, but it doesn't mean you need to be in a, a trade all the time. So be patient, wait for those levels, and, you know, wait, wait for that confirmation before looking to get in.